Can we uh, go on to the next session on Thank you. Uh, really challenging situations in total hip replacement? May I now invite Dr. Jim Sullivan to speak the topic, speak on the topic, uh, total hip arthroplasty in DDH. Uh, thank you. I was going to talk about um, DDH, um, particularly the acetabular side. Um, it's been an interest of mine for, uh, for many years. Uh, development dysplasia is, uh, is a term to convey a spectrum of disease. Uh, etiology is congenital and it, it varies in different population groups. Um, we have a broad population mix in Australia and the rim of the Mediterranean uh, is particularly Turkish, Greek have a high incidence. Um, some of the North African communities, and I understand it's fairly common in China and, and India as well. The underlying di diagnosis in many patients presenting with uh, osteoarthritis early is, um, is developmental dysplasia. The probability and rate of developing osteoarthritis is determined by the degree of dysplasia, and in the end the treatment is, uh, is arthroplasty. Uh, there's several classifications. Classifications are useful um, for writing papers, but also they're useful for understanding treatment. If you can divide patient group up into what treatment regime you offer in each different group, I think they're very helpful. Crow is very popular for writing papers, but it's not particularly helpful for um, deciding what to do. Uh, it's defined by the, the distance that the, the head is um, out of the triacetabulum. Less, type 1 is less than 50%, type 2 50 to 75 uh, percent, type 3 75 to 100, and a high dislocation um, greater than 100. Uh, the classification is quantitative, it's, uh, it's purely a, a, a graded compli uh, complication. The type 2 and 3 overlap, and the, and the type 2 and 3 are the ones who provide the most difficult um, challenges in reconstruction. Other classifications are the Hartophilokitis classification, defined as A is a dysplastic hip, the head's contained. A, type, a B is a overlapping acetabular, um, where you've got to do something to bring the head down, but there's acetabulum to work with, which would normally need augmenting. And there's high dislocations where the acetabulum exists, but it's, it's, it's undeveloped because it's not been stimulated by the presence of the femoral head. So it, the classification separates into different structural anatomical issues which you encounter at surgery, and so it can be discussed more of a qualitative comp, um, classification and in that way in many ways more useful. So type A, the femoral heads contained within the acetabulum with a degree of subluxation. So the anatomy you're presented with is uh, a shallow acetabulum with significant floor osteophytes pushing the hip out. It's, just, it's out further than this side. You get a big build up of bone out underneath there but it's, a, it's a quite a readily reconstructed um, uh, situation. Uh, there's usually some segmental deficiency of the superior wall. The technique to address this is to um, locate the true acetabulum. And the way to do that is to breach the osteophyte, breach the osteophyte, try and identify where the fat pad is so you know where the floor is, try and identify the transverse ligament by clearing the, the, um, the floor osteophytes, you medialise the cup to the true floor and you avoid over reaming to keep the, cu the cup covered anteriorly. The patients in this situation usually have a much narrower AP diameter to the, to the acetabulum than an inferior to superior acetabulum. So you, de you determine you must protect the anterior wall. If you, if you breach the anterior wall, you compromise stability of the cup and also you're likely to get psoas irritation. Now type B, which is a low dislocation, overlapsing acetabuli, the femoral head articulates with the false acetabulum which overlaps the true acetabulum. In the situation you've lost the superior wall, you've got anterior and posterior segmental deficiencies, and you've got a narrow opening and shallowness of the true acetabulum. Again, the technique is to first locate the true acetabulum, as you do in the, in the type A, by breaching the, the, um, the floor osteophyte, try and identify the fat pad, which is always present in the transverse ligament, and start with small reamers, and aim to medialise to try and get at least 70% of host bone cover, and then use a superior lateral graft, which you really, if possible, it should be non-structural. It should be just there to incorporate and to reconstruct the acetabulum. If you're relying on structured graft, you're probably going to have to move it to a cage, which in most situations should not be necessary. Uh, the graft can be a cut piece of the femoral head or reamings from the femoral head. And uncemented shells, and I very much agree with what um, 
Dr. Bose said earlier, in that you want to go for a bigger head as possible, and it's an ideal situation to use something like a delta motion cup. Now, the type C, these are the interesting ones. This is really a femoral problem, not an acetabular problem. The femoral head's located away from the true acetabulum with varying degrees of superior migration. The anatomy is that you've got segmental deficiency of the entire acetabulum, you've got a narrow opening, you've got shallowness of the true acetabulum, you've got excessive antiversion, and you've got an abnormal distribution of bone. The bone has been deposited post superiorly in, in the acetabulum, and there's a big, normally a big nubbin of bone which is built up there, which, which you have to breach when you start your reaming. So the posterior approach, if, and uh, the way we do this is do a planned subtrochanteric osteotomy. And generally what we would do is I use an ESROM and would, would prepare the femur first. We would prepare the femur in situ, put the sleeve of the ESROM in, and then do the osteotomy underneath the sleeve, and then bring, try and bring the, fem the head down to work out how much of the femur you want to remove. To do the acetabulum, you start by opening the elongated capsule and trace your way down to the joint and the capsule will be stretched all the way up there. You gradually work your way down, you clear the soft tissues, retract the femur anteriorly and you try and identify the inferior margin of the acetabulum, again looking for the fat pad in the transverse ligament. Identify the anterior wall and protect the anterior wall and direct your reaming deep into the posterior bone which is back in here. Uh, where your cup will be, will be pushed back into there. And there's good solid bone that you can get your cup into. So you start with small remus directed post stability, protecting the deficient anterior wall. You medialize for coverage. And if you're unsure of your depth, is, uh, you could always perforate the, uh, the floor of the acetabulum with a, with a drill bit and put a, a depth gauge in, just see how far off the floor you are. Um, and you try and leave a few, a few millimetres of, of medial bone on the inside. If, if the floor is penetrated, you can actually gently strip the periosteum off the, off the, um, the back of the pelvis with the, with the back end of a, of a curette, and then pack morselised bone in there and build up the floor that way. And again, the cup is determined by the AP size of the acetabulum, which is there uh, once you've located it. Generally, superior bone graft's not required, and uh, one of the tricks is to, is to not, not get too low. In this case, it's got too low. You see that the cup's below the obturator fossa, and that patient had a, a altered, all, slightly altered gait function, uh, a bit of a circumduction when they walked because they didn't have proper function of the, of the, hips, the hip musculature. Now, if the patient's had previous surgery, this distorts the anatomy. If they've had uh, various osteotomies of the pelvis or the femur, it makes things more complicated. And the other problem is they may have had possible damage to the abductors in, um, in the previous surgery. And uh, it's, I think whatever you do in a, in, a, in a situation where you're trying to do non-arthroplasty management of a hip problem, you should try and respect the fact that they may need a hip replacement later and, and make the, um, the realignment osteotomies as um, salvageable as possible and absolutely try and preserve the hip abductors. This 25-year-old female, she had a previous uh, acetabular osteotomy and previous um, uh, valgizing derotation osteotomy. Just res restored the anatomy as best possible, try, try, and find the true, try and find the true acetabulum, which is down here. No bone graft required, just reamed up into that space there. Uh, had the cup bus roughly level with the uh, transverse ligament. And, and the ESROM is a good bailout in these situations when you've got distorted femoral anatomy. This 42 year old nurse from New Zealand, she'd had bilateral abduction um, osteotomies for, um, uh, for uh, the DDH. Uh, is quite compatible with doing, this, doing this, this reconstruction. She has a native acetabulum still present on both sides. You have to do a subtrochanteric shortening, shortening osteotomy in any case, so the, the bone had to be cut here. The only problem was getting these um, old um, plate and screws out without breaking them, which, was, which did prove a little bit problematic. So that was done sequentially. Uh, if a patient presents who had a previous hip replacement for, um, for a DDH and they've got a high hip, hip centre, I think you still, if possible, you want to try and restore the original anatomy. And if it does require a secondary femoral shortening, it can be done. Um, in this case, it was 12 years old, patient from Lebanon. We're able to, um, the acetabulum is still present. 
as tabulum's here. Once we took the cup out, it was deficient. We had to pack bone graft in there. But this is not, that's not structural graft. You can see the dress tabulum comes out to about here. So we've got almost 70% um, of, of acetabular cover, good area for bone ingrowth. And so the bone graft's not loaded and it gradually took up. Another patient who'd had it, one of the, probably haven't seen these old order four hips, which was ceramic on ceramic hip, put in a high hip center uh, in this situation. Also, the pre-existing acetabulum is there. And this place we put in, we put in allograft, and that's um, seven years down the track. And you wonder why the allograft didn't collapse or fail. And it's because it's non-structural. If it had been structural, it would have failed. We actually get enough support of the cup from the native acetabulum, so the graft is just sitting there and gradually incorporates. So with a high, CD, uh, high discussion type C, you can also consider using an intra-acetabular intra osteotomy. Uh, these figures are from um, Zhang, Hung, uh, Zhang Hong, a uh, colleague from, from Shanghai. She, the technique she uses is to ream down and then do you a corkscrew, a, a cork-shaped circular osteotomy, punching in medially, and this just gives you build-up of bone uh, medially, which remodels. Um, I personally don't think you need to do that a lot, but she's a very experienced, and they do a lot of cases there, and that's their preferred technique, and it's certainly uh, well recognised as a technique. Cemented cups have been used in this situation. Um, early results had MGH many years ago. They don't do that anymore. I know that the Ridington group, they had 45 cases they published um, a, a, quite a long time ago where they, they, they put um, bulk allograft uh, with, uh, with screws and they put the hip centre in there and they do a, um, a, a, they do a trochanteric osteotomy and do the shortening with a trochanteric osteotomy. And they had quite good results, but I don't think anybody really uses this technique anymore for, um, for DDH. Uh, the, and the other fallback is to use a, an acetabular reconstruction ring. Um, but as you can see from the early cases, usually this is not required. So the results of um, uncemented component and autograph, nice tabular photos in 21 hips at 6.9 years, 44 hips in 35 patients, 7.5 years of the Mayo, uh, no resorption of the graft, cementless cups with bowl allograft, 94% success rate at 6.6 years, and I think this is the preferred technique in most centres. So that's tabular considerations, DDH. The aim is to reconstruct in the true native acetabulum, use the classification to predict what the bony deficiencies and what you're going to deal with at the time, medialise the cup uh, to achieve 70% 70, 70 host bone coverage with minimal use of, of structural graft, and avoid oversizing the cup and maximise the size of the bearing for stability. These patients, particularly when you do ephemeral shortening, do have a higher incidence of dislocation. Thanks very much. Questions on PHR and Asia. So this uh, periacetabular osteotomies are now coming up in a big way, the Bernese osteotomy and the rotational osteotomies. If you don't do the femur and just do a reorientation of the acetabulum, does it help your future THR or does it like make the THR difficult? I haven't done a lot of conversions of those, but um, I think in that situation, the plan would be to get a, a CT of the pelvis, try and work out what the orientation of the acetabulum was, and then try and see that you can get something close to what you think is the true matching between the, the antiversion on the femur, antiversion on the cup, so you've got a stable hip. But generally, if you do a, a, one of those osteotomies, you've got, you improve your bone stock mm. so that they should, it should be an easier reconstruction, but when they, dial, when they dial the acetabulum around, it often uncovers it posteriorly slightly, so it can be deficient a little bit posteriorly. Uh, some of your hips actually had a very high riding hip centre, but when you have brought it down considerably low, did any of these patients had nerve injuries? No. Did no. no. And how much you need to shorten? Usually, when you shorten the, generally the it's about five centimeters. As much as five yeah. centimeters. Probably that avoids a nerve injury. I think the the technique with the shortening is that you've reconstructed the acetabulum. You've got the cup in place. You've already prepared the femur with the sleeve in in the femur because you don't want to cut the femur. Uh, we can do that later, but you don't want to cut the femur and then put the sleeve in. You put the sleeve in of the Ezrom, and then you cut the femur, and then you've got an isolated proximal segment of the femur. You do your releases, you leave the abductors intact, then you reduce the proximal segment of bone with the sleeve and its head and neck assembly on it into your true cup, and you bring it around. It's quite tight. You bring it around to sit there. Then you've got the existing femur. You overlap it 
and you can see how much it overlaps with a bit of tension as to what you want to cut. And then you cut, the, you cut it out and then you'll line them up and then you do the ream in the normal way. And because the Ezrom is a, is a dual fixation system, it's got the sleeve fixation, it's got the ribbed uh, stem fixation, it's a very solid fixation. And Early on I used to put wires and, and things around the osteotomy site. These I don't even do a bleak, just do a transverse cut. Don't over the distal femur and put the Ezrom in and it's secure. Uh, Jim, whether 3D printing can help in that? 3D printing, whether it can help in these cases? Sorry? The prototype of 3D printing. <coughs> whether a 3D printer can help in planning of these cases? Yeah. Yeah, get, uh, it's, yeah CT scan. Uh, that technology was not really available when I did most of these cases. So you, you convert yeah. it into the CAT and then... Yeah, you can you do can, that. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see where the bone is, but it's pretty consistent where the bone is, particularly in the type Cs. You've got the deficient acetabulum, but there is a, it's, the, the anatomy is pretty similar most times. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sullivan.